Hi, I'm Amber and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today we have a special guest with us, Joni Gomo. She is a former nurse. Well, actually she still has her credentials. She's just not actively nursing. Um, She was a former keto evangelist coach, keto coach, but now she's off on her own doing her own coaching. She's been doing keto for six years and been feeding her dog raw diets for four years. She is also a certified raw dog food specialist. And that's kind of a big deal. And that's why I asked her to be on today is to share a little bit about raw dog feeding. Welcome, Joni. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to have you on here. I, I've decided that I'm going to start advocating for pets as well as humans, because I think we've really done a disservice in the nutrition area with them. And most of it is because we don't have the information, just like, you know, the information we don't have with human nutrition, the information out there is so awful. And, it, you know, Yep. It, it, there's evidence of that. But uh, anyway, so can we get a background on you? Just tell us everything. You have so much that you've done and I'm so impressed. Go through everything. I, I want ev- the audience to really know where you're coming from. I have been a licensed practical nurse since 1987 in acute care. I worked hospice, oncology, and emergency room. And I sort of pulled back from nursing when we started adding dogs into our home. And the last dog that we added was a paralyzed dog who has special needs and he's really full-time care. So I'm home full-time now. Um, When I left, when I I didn't leave nursing, but when I stepped aside from it and was home more, I'm I'm very much a researcher. I like, I have a more voracious reader and I'm very interested in health and nutrition for myself. But that translated to my dogs. Once I got my my own health under control, I started looking at my dogs. My first dog died of dementia. I am convinced that she would, she also had chronic pancreatitis her whole life. And I am convinced that that was because she was kibble fed, which is a high carb, highly processed diet. I know that's what led to her, her dementia. She had all the same symptoms as an adult with dementia would develop. And it was heartbreaking to watch her end up life like that. And so after I was well on my way on my own ketogenic you know, journey, I started to apply some of the principles that I knew about keto to my dogs. Specifically, are we feeding them an ancestrally appropriate, species appropriate diet? Just like keto is for humans, dogs are carnivores they want meat and they don't want burnt carb balls. You know, that's what I call it. Kibble and burnt carb balls. They don't want that. They eat it like children eat cereal because it's delicious. It's good. It's carby. And that tastes good to them, but that is not what they are meant to eat for a species. Um, And as I I also stepped away from nursing and kind of got out of that a little bit, I started to realize along with my own diet, that I spent my entire career medicating people. Here's a pill for you, a pill for you. Oh, you got this problem. Here's a pill for you. All these pills are giving you side effects. Well, here's another pill for that. And that I kind of got well disillusioned with the whole thing and, and took a step back and said, wait a minute, is that really the answer to, to healthcare is give everybody pharmaceuticals? That is not the answer. And I, I had neck surgery and I have autoimmune thyroid disease. And I was looking for non-pharmaceutical ways to treat those things. And I discovered along the way, and I'm also, I've always loved um, uh, nutritional supplements and stuff like, I've always been really into that stuff, but I didn't really do anything with it when I was working and stuff. And I started to read more about it when I had more time on my hands and realized that there's supplements that can do for you what a pharmaceutical can, can do, but, but there's a diet that can do so much more than anything, you know? And if, if all these people, look, when I was growing up, people were not on the drugs and these diseases that exist today, diseases, none of them existed when I was a kid. I believe it's my personal opinion that all of these things came about because big pharma needed to peddle drugs, more drugs. 
And that may be a controversial statement and not everybody agrees with that, but I believe that if you get to the root cause of things, you can often fix them without drugs, without pharmaceuticals. Imagine. And the same goes for our dogs. The same thing goes for our dogs. And oh, I'm going to have to put my tin hat on now. <laughs> you know, and we, I owe a lot of credit to my veterinarian because she is a functional, sort of a functional medicine veterinarian. She, she's, she provides me alternatives always to drugs. And I, I, they've always worked. I've never, very rarely have I ever had to say, oh, this isn't working. Let's do a drug for the dog now. Very rare. I've rarely, Cobb is the only one and it's because of his special needs, but they're all on Chinese herbs, functional med stuff and a raw food diet. That's awesome. Let's talk a little bit about why did you decide to get certified as a raw dog food specialist? Uh, that kind of goes along with my, my inner researcher. And, you know, for me, when I start looking into things, it becomes, I overturn this stone and I read all this stuff, but that leads me to another stone and another stone. And I keep wanting to know more and more and more. And I want to know the why behind what I'm doing. So when COVID happened and the lockdowns happened, um, DNM was offering a free course. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing, I'm so doing that because I was already so obsessed with my dog's diet and nutrition, wanting it to be as optimal as possible. And so I signed up and took that course. I didn't do it with the intention of having raw feeding clients or to counsel anybody on feeding their dogs. I really did it for my own knowledge and so that I could better care for my three dogs, particularly my paralyzed dog. And also because my, my first miniature schnauzer, Misty, the tragic way that she died with canine dementia, I never want to see another dog go through that again. I've also had friends who've lost their dogs to the, a big one in kibble fed dogs is diabetes. That's a big one. And so is pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both, all three of those dementia, diabetes, pancreatitis, they're devastating to watch your family member. My dogs are my family members. It's devastating to watch them wither away and get worse and worse and worse. It's heartbreaking. <sighs> Hmm. I still, <laughs> I'm still having a hard time dealing with the death of my dog because of what you just said, because <laughs> of diabetes, because of the crap diet that I didn't know was hurting her and that, that and guilt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still have that guilt and I hmm. understand where you're coming from, but the biggest and most proactive way to get past that and it's, it's hard. I understand the guilt that you're saying. I still have the mom guilt because of my Misty, but the biggest way to get over that is to become so proactive with what you know better now. You know, when you know better, you do better. Yes. Yes. And it will be different. <laughs> well, starting with my puppy that I get in I, what, five weeks now, <laughs> that it will be different. And I will be advocating for pets and I will be consulting. So I don't want that to happen again <laughs> to anybody. Just like with me, you know, with my 40 years of struggle, I don't want anybody else to have to go through what I did when they can learn from me. You know why? I wouldn't, wor I wouldn't put that on my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And so if we can do something to make that change, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Cobb, your paralyzed dog. How did that come about and why did you decide to take on that immense responsibility? Because I'll tell you what, there's not many people who would. He is my pride and joy. <laughs> my girls are too, but he is my pride and joy. And I think that, and now here's where I get teared up because he means so much to me. He was almost euthanized and I was scroll. I followed a schnauzer Facebook page because I have schnauzers. I've always had schnauzers. And I saw one day that the rescue took in this paralyzed dog and all, listing all of his special needs and what would happen. And if, you know, he was almost euthanized at the shelter if the rescue hadn't taken him in. I had had neck surgery, you probably see my scar. I had, I have degenerative disc disease and I had spinal cord compression at one point. And it was the most 
horrific pain I've ever had, topping out childbirth and kidney stones a thousand percent. But I got, I got that repaired. I got my life back on track and everything and it put that behind me. But when I saw this dog come up in the rescue page, something pulled at my heart. And I don't know if it was divine intervention. I don't know what it was, but I knew what that dog was feeling. Now he was paralyzed. He had such traumatic spinal cord damage that he was, he was paralyzed and wasn't probably going to recover any of that. But I know the muscle spasms and stuff that goes along with the spinal cord compression. And I'm like, I got to meet this dog. So I contacted his original foster family that night through Facebook. And I'm like, any chance you live near me? And can I come meet this dog? Turns out they lived in the same town that we did. And I now, so I'm upstairs in my office thinking, how am I going to convince my husband that we got to go meet this dog tomorrow? Not to adopt, not anything. I just wanted to meet him. And so I thought. So I went downstairs and I'm like, Hey, you know, we're going to go meet this dog tomorrow. You know, it's nothing, doesn't mean anything. We're not going to like adopt it or anything. I just want to meet the dog. And he agreed. He was like, so agreeable. I couldn't believe it. I mean, no, no questioning, nothing. He's like, okay, no problem. So we went the next day and he was still on crate rest. He was in a pen. Um, They didn't know how long previously he had been injured. A good Samaritan picked him up on the side of the road. He was army crawling across six lanes of traffic, horrible storms we have tornado season here. It was during those storms. Somebody saw him army crawling across the highway and picked him up. The name of the street was South Cobb drive. When you drop a dog off at the shelter, they have to have a name. So they said, Oh, Cobb, that's where I found him. And the shelter was going to euthanize him. So the rescue stepped in and said, no, let's see if we can rehab him and get him to a point where he can walk again and be adoptable. And right after I met this dog, literally right after I met him, I came home and talked to my husband. I'm like, what if we just co-foster with the other? I don't want, I don't want another dog, but let's just co-foster. And he's like, hey, yeah, that's okay. You're home now. We could probably do that. Let's do it part-time. So We started off co-fostering in part-time for just a couple of months. By December of that year, he just didn't go home anymore. He was with us. And we started talking about, well, we started taking him on trips with us. You know, we just sort of put him into our schedule. If we were going somewhere, he just went to, you know, it was part of our schedule. And I talked to the rescue at one point. We're going to have to talk about poop in this conversation. (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) When he was in the rescue, he was on uh, kibble and it wasn't great food and kibble fed dogs. By this point, my other two were already raw fed. Kibble fed dogs have more frequent stools and softer stools than raw fed dogs. Well, now you have a paralyzed dog having soft, mushy stools. Doesn't know he's going. I'm like, uh uh-uh, something's got to give with this. So I contacted the, the, um, the head of the rescue. And I'm like, Hey, can we change his food? I have my other two on this food. I'd really like to put him on this food too. It'd be really beneficial with his bowels and would make life a lot easier for me. And at this point, I still wasn't thinking we were going to adopt him because of <laughs> really, that was a big problem. I can't have poop all over my house all the time. So she said, sure, no problem. They started sending that same food immediately. I started noticing not just the difference in his bowels, but he always had a lot of gunk in his eyes, like constant gunk coming out of his eyes. Within a week of switching him, no more gunk even in his eyes. And, you know, it was just, it was just amazing to see the change in him. I put him on a, on a bowel schedule, pretty much like you put a paralyzed person on so that I knew when he was going to have a bowel movement and there were no accidents. All of a sudden we had no more poop accidents and life was awesome again in my house. Well, then I started thinking to my husband, I'm like, you know, what if somebody, you know, he was in rehab this whole time. He was making some progress, but at one point it became clear that he was never going to walk again. He was going to be permanently paralyzed. And I started talking to my husband, what if somebody adopts him? And they fall in love with what they see online and in these videos. And then they get him and decide, oh my God, this is more work than I bargained for. And they dump him again. 
Yep. You no, know, I didn't want that future for him. And then I thought, or the other scenario was, what if somebody out of the area adopts him and I never hear about him again? I said, Paul, what are we going to do? So then the conversation became, and, and all this time, everybody on Facebook was, you know, you're going to adopt him. You're going to get him. You're going to get him. And all this time, I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not getting another dog. We have two. We're not getting another dog. I started to get kind of irritated at everybody that was kind of badgering me to adopt him. I'm like, gosh, you do this to couples that don't have any children. Uh-huh. <laughs> they feel like when you're like, when are you having a baby? When are you having a baby? You know, you're going to, you know, I'm like, that's a lot of pressure. I'm like, I'm not adopting another dog. But then Paul and I had those conversations and I'm like, I think we're going to adopt him. <laughs> and he's like, I think we're going to adopt him too. Aww. He's already, he's already part of our household. And he has certainly wormed his way into our hearts. We have his routine down. He's a GOMO. We're going to adopt him. So that's how we ended up with Cobb. I love it. And you just started a, is it a Facebook page for Cobb? Is that right? Is that what I saw? You know, Cobb has had a Facebook page for a couple of years now. Oh, okay. I took his stories and I started doing his post. The people in the Schnauzer page were, they were amazed with all of his posts and everything and they loved it. And I started to see that he got all the attention on his posts, but the foster dogs that still needed homes was kind of taking attention away from them. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start in the zone Facebook page. So that's how his page came about. Oh, okay. I'm an Instagram newbie. So, but I went ahead and did it. My daughter told me it's the thing I needed to have. Right. So I have that too for Cobb, but just recently, actually last night, his, his website went live. And so he, that's what I saw the yes, website. His website. It just went live last night. He's Cobb is a celebrity dog now. So he has shot at Times. He has shot a Swiffer TV commercial that, that um, is on his Facebook page and now it's on his website. How cool. And then this past fall, he shot a reality TV show called To the Rescue. And he will have a special segment of his rescue story told in Atlanta. It's on mm-hmm. CBS on Sundays. It hasn't aired yet. I don't know when it's going to air. It's supposed to be sometime in May. I don't know where it airs in the rest of the country either. But so he's going to be on TV. He's I've been in several local magazines and a national magazine, um, Family RV magazine. He was in that magazine because we RV. And we joke that our motorhome is Cobb's tour bus because we really, <laughs> people I love it. Us on Facebook and want to know where we are in the country. And they want oh to my God. We've had people drive over a hundred miles just to come meet my dog. You know, it's it's the cutest thing in the world when they meet him. That is so neat. So you were going to show us Cobb. Is is he in the area or? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, hi, Cobb. And he has his, his little special wheels, doesn't he, for his back end? He does. He's got a wheelchair, but he doesn't use it in the house. Oh. Um, his wheels tend to get stuck on furniture and stuff, and he is able to pull himself around by the front half of his body. He does that. Wow. And I have actually, my home is now a uh, canine handicapped adaptable, <laughs> meaning that I have yoga mat trails all through my house. I used to do rugs, but they were too hard to keep clean. So I replaced them. I had the brilliant idea of using yoga mats. So it's perfectly padded for him and he knows to stay on them. And literally they go from room to room all around my house. And how but, cute. Yeah, those are Animals are amazing. People, I don't think fully really understand that. And, you know, it, it, they're just these little miracles, you know, and for me, I like, children and dogs you know you know animals in general but you know to me that's like you know I you want to put a smile on my face it's going to be a dog or a child or an exactly. other, you know? me too me too a thousand times yes <laughs> now um with your other dogs when you first started the raw diet what did you notice after you started feeding them that? Cause, cause they were on kibble, I'm assuming, or they were on kibble and I thought they were on high quality kibble. 
until I learned that there really is no such thing. There's not, no. There's mm -hmm. not. I mean, there are better versions of kibble mm -hmm. out there, but there's no such thing as good kibble. And right. I would never recommend anybody feed their dog kibble. Me too. And my mom at 80 years old just got her first dog for the first time in her life yesterday. She flies up here from Florida just to see my dog. It's not to see me. It's to see my dog. <laughs> and she wanted a dog for a long time. And of course they sent her home with kibble and I'm, my daughter and I both are trying to talk to her about, she's probably not going to do raw, but higher quality kibble if she must, you know, so we're, we're trying, we're going to work on her a little bit. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, the other two dogs, I, when we first switched them, it was after Misty died. And, you know, my, the, the pet food owner, I go, I don't shop in big box pet food stores. I shop in stores that carry quality product. And those are usually smaller boutique stores. And the one near me, Sassy Paws, I had been going there for years to buy my high quality kibble for my, my dog with dementia and pancreatitis. Every time she had a pancreatitis flare, I would talk to the owner of the store, who is also a, a pet food specialist and a raw dog food specialist. And she would very subtly, but always consistently put the raw food bug in my ear. She mentioned it. And at first I was repulsed. Oh God, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And, you know, and, and. I, every time she, I would complain about my dog, she's like, you know, raw food's still in her. It's not as hard as it used to be. You can buy it frozen. But I was, no, 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 I'm not doing that. And of course, the veterinarians tell you it's not safe. The salmonella E. coli, which is a bunch of lies, that's not even, you handle raw meat to cook for your family. It's no different than giving it to your dog. It's not any different at all. So it took me a long time to realize that just like you don't always want to take the advice of, of a doctor just because he's a doctor, I don't always want to take the advice of a veterinarian just because they're a veterinarian, especially yeah. a veterinarian that tells me that raw, raw feeding my dog is going to kill my dog, you know, and these guilt yeah. It's like, it's exactly like doctors telling you that keto is going to give you a heart attack. Uh huh. It's the exact <laughs> same thing. Because that's what they're taught. That's that right. that is what's out there and and for the most part they have to follow those guidelines or they you know can get into trouble they can lose their license i mean and a lot of ven veterinarian schools are funded by pet food manufacturers purina mm -hmm. the big one you know so hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah there's a connection there's always a connection and i always tell right them, follow the money follow the money oh god yeah that's what i say all the time but you know foil hat, you know, tinfoil hat up on our head, but it's, it's the truth and, and we're living it. And unfortunate for me, when, once I found out that my dog was diabetic, she was already blind and I'm sure the raw diet helped in some way, but the damage was so done mm -hmm. that it was too late. It was right. just too late. And, you know, we battled it and we thought she was okay. And then it was probably a good seven, eight months or so. And then she all of a sudden went into ketoacidosis oh. and we couldn't get her blood sugars down. And then she had a major seizure and it was just awful. It was just awful. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Uh, but right. it was just too late for me, but I'm not making that mistake again. So. <laughs> I know I'm, yeah. I'm not either. I'm, I'm forever not doing that either. But but after Robin started putting that from the pet food store, bug in my ear about the raw feeding. And after Misty died, one day my daughter Becky came over and said, "Mom, you've got to watch this movie." No, 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 no. Oh right? yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> and uh, she put this movie. She's like, "It's on Netflix or something, whatever." And I'm like, "I have to pay for it, you know." And she's like, "Mom, just watch it." So, I bought it, by the way. Yeah. So I'm going to buy copies of it to give away. Oh, good so idea. I'm hoping you can buy it on DVD. I haven't looked into that yet, but we sat there and watched that movie in utter silence. It's her second time watching it. And after the conclusion of that movie, that day, I went back to Robin at Sassy Paws and I said, okay, tell me what I got to do to switch my dogs because I'm not giving them kibble ever, ever again. And I've been raw feeding ever since then. And she was a tremendous help between her and my daughter. 
huge, huge helps. I would never have done it without her or my daughter. And I'm so glad both of them. It was meant to be. It was absolutely meant to be. Okay, now let's talk about the movie. It's called Pet Fooled. F-O-O-L-E-D, Pet Fooled. And uh, Joni had me look at that movie. I had never even heard of it, to be honest with you. So I looked it up on Amazon Prime and I went ahead and just bought it. I was like, I know I'm going to reference this or need this. And there's a lot of it I actually did know about. And that's, you know, part of the reason why I did transition my dogs onto raw. Um, once I found out all this bad stuff, because I thought I was feeding my dog really good kibble stuff. Cause we looked at the ingredients, we researched, we blah, blah, blah. But you know, when you're watching that movie, you're like, yeah, I fell for that. Yep. I fell for that too. Yep. Yep. And Tell me something in that movie that just really floored you. What stood out to you that kind of smacked you in the face? The dump truck of all the roadkill carcasses that were falling into the pet food manufacturing plant. And the fact that they actually can legally make dog food from roadkill. Mm -hmm. From where I, I had that conversation with my mom this morning. She was like, oh, 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 that's awful. I don't think she quite believes that they do that. They do do that. And yes, they do. Disgusting. And it, they and can, what, what is that called? What is, is it byproducts? Is that how they label it? Byproducts. Do, byproducts, byproducts yeah. yeah. So if you see that word, yeah, visualize a bunch of dead for a long time animals that have rotted, that are, it, it's nasty, being all ground up and put into your animal's food. And that's what you're feeding them. It's just, it's just, it's incomprehensible to me. To me, my dogs, I don't know a dog owner out there. I, I know they probably are out there, but no, none of the people I know would feed their dogs something like that if they saw that. If they knew. Yeah. They and, and, the, and that, that is at least natural, <laughs> But it, it, then you look at all the other ingredients, all of the chemicals and seed oils. Right. What the heck does a dog need seed oil for? Tell it's me that. Ran it's rancid. You know, it, yeah, it's already rancid from the get go. And they don't need any of that stuff in the wild. No, it? not at all. It, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I went back and I kind of looked through some of the pet foods out there that are supposed to be good. And reading through the ingredients again, now with my eyes even more open, I'm like, wow, wow, wow. And this is what most of us feed our dogs because it's easier. It's a, some can be cheaper, although ours was not exactly cheap food, but it is, you know, less expensive than a raw diet for, for most people, depending on how you do it. But once you realize just how incredibly bad it is, and especially if you had dogs that suffered, I mean, how many dogs do you see now that have those little fatty tumors? Oh, so many all of over. Them. Both you, of mine do. You know what else did. I noticed? This you probably notice this too now. I noticed, and it's not a judgment on overweight people. Please don't think that. But I have noticed that overweight people have overweight dogs. It's true. It's true. And, it, and it's carb overload in both cases. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the sad thing with, with my dog is when we even we did switch her to raw and it was the right amount. It wasn't like we were way overloading it or anything. And she just started putting on the weight, putting on the weight, putting on the weight. Huh. Insulin. Insulin. It's and we had to keep increasing it. Yeah. Increasing. Yep. Yeah. So that, that was, that was it's very sad. That are on insulin, yeah. You know? And let's talk about the, the, the price of, of feeding raw. My take is if you add up all the vet bills, all the insulin, all the syringes, all the thyroid medications, yep. mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you <laughs> feeding raw is a heck of a lot cheaper. I'm just going to say it a is. lot cheaper. Because we were spending, uh, I want to say probably about 300 or more dollars on just vet medication Crazy. a month. And that's not even the food. Because like I said, we, we got the good, the best food we could. Right. So trust me, it's a heck of a lot more expensive it to is. deal it, with diabetes and thyroid. And it's another parallel with keto carnivore. You know, people often will tell me, oh, it's so expensive to eat like that. Carnivore. Yes. All that meat you got to buy. 
And my response is always, well, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than trying to pay for a chronic disease. <laughs> yeah, pay for insulin right now. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. tell me the cost of insulin right now. Yeah. Smile, right? And not to mention ICU bills. I mean, that's not cheap either, you know? It, it's a heck of a lot cheaper. But they, you know, sometimes they'll go, oh, I didn't see think of it like that. But then other times, you know, I, it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what yeah. people are thinking. I feel like they're, they're ready when they're ready. Oh, oh, definitely. It, that goes, it, yeah, all the way around on, on everything. It, people are not going to make a change until they have a reason to. And that's really sad. And that's where we come in mm -hmm. to talk about where it can lead. And especially when you have a dog when, and you see all these little fatty tumors, it's no big deal. They're, they're, but I don't remember growing up as a kid ever seeing a dog with a fatty tumor. Never. And now you see dogs with them all over and they're, they're oh. obese and they're, you know, having to take thyroid medication, a dog on thyroid medication. I'm not saying that never, ever, there was a dog that needed thyroid medication that, you know, wasn't due to something else. I mean, there's always exceptions, but right. for the most, most part, come on, come on. You are, you pretty well know where that came from, it, you know, and yeah, it is. And it, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it because it, know, it costs you, it costs you your heart too. Yeah, it's so much more than just the money when, you know, it's just not worth it. Just, just, you know, do some research. I'm not saying you have to go do this, but do some research. You know, and it's so know, important. That, like we're talking about, you know, big pharma has a lot to do with the FDA and how we treat diseases and things like this. We were talking about, it's so frustrating that nobody ever mentioned diet being, yep. being medicine, right? Food can be medicine. I always tell people food can be your medicine or it can be your poison. Pick yep. one, you know, it's the same for the dogs, but the truth of the matter is they need people on drugs because it's a, it's a funding thing. And it's the same thing for dogs. I mean, FDA, you know, they manage dog medications too. And, you know, it's beneficial for dogs to be on pills too. It makes it's a money. Oh maker. yeah. Heck yeah. It, it's sickening. Okay. It, that one part in the movie what kind of struck me a little bit is when you go into one of these big box uh, pet stores and there's like a million food, right? And then you have this organic and you have, you know, no grain added and you have all this stuff that sounds so good and the packaging is so great. And do I remember it correctly where out of all those pet foods, there's really just five different manufacturers. Is that right? Like yeah. five? Yes. I So <laughs> what do you think is happening? I mean, if, if you're buying all if, the same stuff. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Oh, uh, and you know what else was a big deal? The prescription diets. Everybody thinks, oh, but it's a prescription. Yep. And, and you bite at the vets. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's not. It's just as bad or worse. Just yeah. As oh, bad. yeah. 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 It's shocking. It, 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 the problem is we're too trusting because why would somebody, you know, want to do something to hurt us? But look at humans. We have been hurt from the, from the poor advice to the actual products, right. to, you know, the medications process to the whole, yeah, processed foods, the whole thing. So they don't care about your health. I'm sorry to tell you, they don't care about your health. The bottom line is money. Hello, money talks. And if you're kidding yourself. If you think they care, they don't. Mm -hmm. And that I think is my biggest thing. And it makes me very angry. It makes me angry with the pet food industry. It makes me angry with how nutrition is approached for humans too, exactly. from our government, from the ADA to a the AHA. I mean, all of them, you know, it's, it, it's just infuriating because mm -hmm. they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about you. No. They don't care about you. No. And you know, you're, you're, your dogs too. I mean, that, that's, that's horrifying to me to, me too. I don't know, people at least can have their own mind and, you it's know, themselves. right. And they make their choices. You are making choices for your children and your animals. Right. Exactly. To and me, they, that's and dogs. Dogs can't say no. Dogs nope. can't say, oh, I want to get nope. something different. Nope. You know, they trust you to feed them and give them the best that you can give them. And, you know, that's, I, that's where I feel like, you know, this guy, this guy has totally benefited. <laughs> I <Yeah. call. laughs> Hey buddy. <laughs>
Yeah, and let's let's talk a little bit more about the the training. And I'm actually certified too as a raw dog food. You know that um, because Joni got me into that. But let's talk a little bit about that training. Number one, as we've discussed, that was hard. That oh, final oh. exam was so hard. I felt like a complete idiot. I mean, it's been a while since I, well, I've taken some certifications, but it's been a while since I've been in college and all, but good God. Yeah. I mean, I, I had just about an anxiety attack. I, I, was like going to. I, I felt like, man, after this, I better have a veterinarian degree. <laughs> but I know, that's what I felt like. Holy crap. Oh chemistry involved and I'm like oh. I know and in the in the in the questions I'm like oh 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 <laughs> you know did I forget something or what oh that was so hard that was so hard but I thought it was extremely valuable yeah. and I am so incredibly glad I took it even though I didn't get it for free but whatever it was worth it and that was a promise I made to myself and to my dog that passed away that I was going to do this this is something I needed to do <laughs> to kind of help maybe alleviate some of the guilt mm -hmm. and to help others. Yeah. And I made that promise and I did it. <laughs> I did it in three days or two days, two days, something like that. Oh and my it was I, bet it took me, I bet it took me a week to get through that first course. It was so hard. Oh, it was so hard. So hard. <laughs> but okay. One thing that kind of, I guess, surprised me to some degree like you always hear, oh, wolves are the dog's ancestors. And then you hear nowadays so many, oh, no, because dogs are domesticated. They're, 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 everything has changed. Evolution has changed them. They, they need the kibble. It's, it's not about eating a carnivore diet anymore. It's, um, okay, wrong, because they have found that, what is it, a 0.02% difference between the, the DNA of a wolf and a dog. So, yeah. yeah. Their dogs are carnivores, people. That doesn't mean that they didn't eat some vegetation. Some they ate some berries, they ate some offshoots of the grass. They did do stuff like that. And of course, whatever prey they had uh, that had the vegetation in their stomachs or, you know, that whatever they ate. But beyond that, so what did you find that surprised you or, you know, kind of? What I that stood out. What, what stood out for me is every time I went through one of the modules or I answered a question on a test, I found the most striking thing about the whole course to me is how parallel a dog's nutrition, ideal nutrition is to what a human's ideal nutrition yes, is. Yes, yes. And there are so many similarities. And, and some of the, the test was hard, granted. But so many of these questions are already new from being keto. My knowledge. Yes, me too. Oh, the answers were the same. Yes. So it it was very that was a very striking thing for me. And I've told I've told a couple of people, you know, this course and your dogs ought to be eating the same way. And you know, we should eat that way. And there's so many similarities. So many. I, I agree. And as I'm going through all this, I'm like, oh, this is not gonna be hard. I already know all this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got a little too cocky because <laughs> then it was like, oh God, oh God, oh God. I knew from my nursing background also, I'm like, oh, I'm taking another state board exam. But then another chemistry, I'd be like, oh crap, I don't know the answer to that, you know. And, and I, then you didn't have any time. No. There wasn't enough time. And if you so think you're going to be question. looking in your notes and stuff, no, yeah. you don't have time for that. And calculations, forget it. Forget There's it. no time. I, I just, I just skip those I guessed I mean sure people, I didn't have time I'm sure people think oh you're taking a course online piece of cake whatever. Uh -huh. no. Oh, no it was an education for certain I learned it was so much taking oh I did too I did too so and, and like I, I told you before I start consulting or anything like that I'm going to go back through the course and go through every single module and instead of worrying about taking notes and trying to you know get something out of it picking the important parts I'm going to ah. really absorb it and really really make sure I know you know what I'm talking about and what I'm doing right and practice some more on my dogs you know I've been feeding them raw like I said uh, seven eight months whatever it is now, are you make, are you making the food I you? am oh I am. Wow, good for you yeah. But here's the problem we had um, with, with the one dog we still have. She has some just really major issues that have started happening oh, probably the last, I don't know, year or whatever. She started losing muscle mass and she was like part lab and we think part pit bull. So she had the pit bull back, the back area with, with her, her 
thighs and that area just like oh, muscular. And now it's like nothing. It's atrophied so bad, atrophied. And, um, and she just started just like dropping poop everywhere. It's like, she doesn't even know she's going. It's like, you know, her, her area, the peristalsis, whatever is paralyzed or something. I don't know, but she doesn't feel it. She does not uh, go, you know, pee in the house. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's, my husband looked it up and he's been doing a lot of research and all, and he thinks he's figured out what it is. We don't have a diagnosis. We've been putting off taking her to the vet because it freaks her out so bad. And she's old, she's 14, yeah. that I'm afraid that that is going to be too much. Play, they're going to be a distraction. Yeah, it's not bothering me, <laughs> but yeah, so she now what I'm trying to feed her, we're trying to figure it out. She has bad teeth again. Kibble is great for the teeth um, and she can't chew bones. And as you know, from the course, calcium is extremely important and they need the bones. Well, she, she won't eat chicken feet. She, will, she barely would eat chicken necks. They had to be a little small, but the other bones, you know, she tried to chew on it, but she, she can't chew the bones. So, so after this course and realizing how detrimental that calcium is for dogs and bones, we, my husband bought a grinder and he ground up his own it's chicken feet, turkey necks, chicken necks. It's some bones. Uh, all kind, Yes. And so we didn't have to try to find the processed bone meal. And um, she actually likes it. She's eating it and her poop is not runny anymore. I think I told you that story where it was like all over the house the other day. And I was like, oh. and now it, it, I fed her too much of the bones and it was like chalky, chalky poop. I know we're talking poop, but it's, it's, it's important to look at their poop. It is. It is important but, to look at but a rock dead dog's poop when they actually have normal poop and there's enough bone meal in it. Yep. It will be runny and it will actually, if you leave it in the yard, it disintegrates like ash. Yeah, and it's weird. Reason, and the reason for that is because when they poop, a raw fed dog poops, it's truly is waste. They're using all the nutrition of everything they ate and all they have to poop out is waste. So it disintegrates into nothingness because there's hardly any poop left. Because yeah. they've got all the, all the benefits of the, the true nutrition. It makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so hers went from being runny to like chalk. And I was like, oh, I might have given her too much. <laughs> so we're kind of playing with the ratios. But we, we like use a base of ground meat, 80-20. And as you know, you don't want it too fatty because that's not what you find in the wild. And it, it cannibalizes nutrients and protein, et cetera, right? That's something I did not know. I learned that from the course. So I've been kind of trying to supplement. So I use very, very lean meat to add in with it. And I cut it up in small chunks it's like stew meat mm -hmm. and then I'll also do a chicken breast and cut up a few pieces of just plain chicken breast without the fat and then I add in the bone mixture and it's all and I, my hands are all up in this y'all like all in see my nails I got nails and this all up in there but I don't even care anymore I've been carnivore for over two years now and I'm always touching meat and it's raw and it's whatever I've eaten raw meat I mean it's no big deal so I'm all up in that and mixing I'm mixing it up in there with my hands because my dog doesn't like it being separated she wants it all mixed in. Uh, it's ridiculous but she is enjoying it she's eating it and today her poop was perfect so I'm like, yay, go poop, you know. <laughs> I know that's really sad when you're excited about what your dog's poop looks like. Oh, no, I am but it's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, so yay. So how do you implement the raw diet? I, I know I, you use so, a, a go, ahead. go ahead. So my daughter, when we first watched that movie, she switched her dog and she had the calculations down pat. She knew how much muscle meat, how much bone, how much um, secreting organ, non-secreting organ. She knew all the ratios for everything. And she is like a total brainiac. And I'm so in awe of her. She even wow. went to the farmer's market and bought the food. I mean, the, the meat, I mean, carts of meat. She has a 180 pound English Mastiff. So this is the dog that she was raw feeding. Whoa. Well, it got quite expensive as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So she... Unfortunately, she's not able to continue doing that, just lifestyle has changed. And so she, you know, she treats raw and she gives them as much raw as they she can, but it it wasn't sustainable. She did it for two years, but she couldn't keep it up. Wow. But I don't do that because we travel so much. We take cod on on tour all the time via RV. 
And so I needed something that was going to be quick and easy and pre-measured. So I actually feed a pre-made frozen raw diet. And I can interchange that with the freeze dried that you just reconstitute with a little bit of water. So that's what I give my dogs. And then I supplement stuff in between, like a little bit of parsley, spinach. They like green beans, mm. blueberries. So I give them organic stuff like that that I can mix in on the side. But yes, I do frozen or freeze dried raw, mostly frozen. And it's and, and, to, to rotate those proteins too, because right. every protein offers something different. So I, I'm constantly rotating which proteins they get also. Is that expensive? It's not cheap, but it is much more cheaper than chronic veterinary bills and chronic disease management, you know? Yeah. So it's about, I think I pay about $18 a bag. Now I'm feeding three dogs. So if it was just one dog, it's a piece of cake, no problem. Yeah. I wouldn't even blink at the price, but feeding three dogs, it's a little pricey. But my dogs, including my paralyzed dog that has other complications because of his paralysis, it's, it's worth it to me because it prevents, I mean, I'm so proud of the fact that he has not, he can't pee on his own. I manually empty his bladder a couple of times a day. But initially when we first got him, he had chronic UTIs, chronic UTIs mm. all the time. And he was, and I knew it was because he can't empty his own bladder and mm. I can't do as good a job of he could do if he were able-bodied but I always looked at it that I was failing him every time he got a UTI so then I bought pH strips I monitor his urine pH constantly like a hawk and my my veterinarian who is very pro-functional medicine gave she does she practices a lot of Chinese herbs and she's also a chiropractor so we put our heads together she worked with me just beautifully and he is on an entire regime of natural supplements and herbs and cranberry and, you know, extra water in his food to keep his urine diluted and everything. And it's been huge. And I believe that between my vet, you know, working as a team with me and the raw feeding, it has been phenomenal for him. It's made a huge difference in his health, in my girl's health too, but particularly in his health. That, that's a huge thing. And we're kind of lucky. Our, our vet, she had no issue when we said, oh, we, we feed them, you know, a raw diet. She had no issue. And, you know, when we started having all these complications and she never said, oh, it's that raw diet. You need to get it back on kibble. You know, she never went there. She's not necessarily, you know, putting it out there. Oh, we feed your, you know, dogs raw necessarily. But I appreciate the fact that she's supportive. Of, of that choice. And I was pretty impressed with my vet actually, especially through all the, you know, after my dog was put down and what they did for us, it was, it was very touching. And they have my loyalty now because of that, because they actually seem to care. And that's a huge thing because you should want a vet for your animals, like you would want a doctor for you because there are vets out there that are just very business-like and that's fine if that's what you want, but I want somebody to care about my dog or a cat or whatever you have, you know, that's important to me because especially if you have to leave them, that's heartbreaking because my dogs, they're used to us being home all the time. There, there, there are dogs or dog now, but you know, having to go somewhere under that stressful situation, whew, Right. It's scary. So it's nice to know because we would have the vets, you know, go, oh, we just love her. She's so cool. And then the office workers, you know, oh, yeah, I was blah, blah, blah. You know, and I was like, OK, I feel a little bit better. I mean, why would they lie and say that go out of their way to say that, you know, so it made me feel better. But I do think it's important. Would you not agree to find a vet that, like you said, you have a great vet that is helping work with you? That's huge. That's just like a person with their, their doctor. I mean, it's you know, huge. And a lot of times I will tell people, especially keto people, um, that, or they'll say, oh, my doctor won't allow me to do keto. I've heard that so much. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. Doctors are your healthcare partners. They're not your healthcare dictators. So when you say your doctor won't allow something, um, no, you make the final decision, but it's up to you to be your own advocate and do your own research on this. Yes. Stuff. It's yes. the same thing with a veterinarian. Now, before I found this vet, I was with my doctor, I, just, I can't 
can't even go there because it's basically socialized veterinary medicine. I won't say the name, but I went to this vet who told me I was going to kill my dog if I fed him raw, you know, and, and he was as nice as I thought he could be. But to, when he said something like that, I am like, oh, no, don't even get me started on this. But then take it a step further. He, they started when I found out when I got on this health quest of my own, and then I got my dogs raw fed and I started learning more about their health. I, I, I've never been an anti-vaxxer. That's not who I am. However, I decided that instead of just giving shots to my dogs willy nilly every year, I wanted to pull titers on them and see if the vaccines they got the previous year were still active in their body. And if they were, the titer would tell you that. And so I started doing titers on my dogs and they came back positive. You don't. Interesting. Yes. You don't need to keep injecting them every year. Now, rabies in Georgia is by law. I do it every few years for my dogs, but, but the other ones stay active in their system. And you, all you have to do is draw a titer. And if wow. the titer says this is still active in them, there's no reason to keep injecting them. And so I got pushed back from my old vet on that also. And I'm like, but the titer, and then I got educated and I started challenging it. Well, like the titer is positive. It's, it's either positive or negative, you know, and if they're still protected, why would I inject them again? Yeah, so then, that makes no sense. So then when I switched to this new vet, well, they're all about it. They're like, no, 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 no. You don't need to do that every year. Draw a titer. If they're still protected, there's no reason to keep injecting them. And my vet is also, she, she is my animal's healthcare advocate. She's not a veterinary dictator. She works with me. And if I have a problem, when I was having all those problems with Cobb GTIs, she brainstorms stuff with me or she'll mm-hmm. send me a message and say, hey, I was thinking about this. She truly cares for my dogs. And I, I will be a customer and a client of hers for life because of that. Also, I add she raw feeds her own dogs. <laughs> nice what a better advocate right <laughs> yeah and she told me I was going to kill my dog feeding them raw and she didn't you know she's all about doing the titers so. see that that completely blows my mind when somebody su- makes a statement like that based on absolutely zero proof exactly. and if if they are in fact a carnivore which research proves that I mean their DNA proves that they're basically a wolf pretty much and yeah okay some vegetation sure whatever that's fine but to think that what they were meant to eat is going to kill them what the what and they their stomach acids if they're not eating the crap kibble is acidic and that is meant to break down meat, just like a human, right. just like a vulture, just like anybody who's meant to eat food. And how is, if your acidity in your stomach is high enough, it kills most of those pathogens, right? That, that you're so concerned or these people right. are so concerned about. Exactly. Exactly. It, it blows my mind that this whole generation and even the generation behind or prior to us somehow thinks that commercially made dog food (laughs) is nutritionally sound and healthy and what you should be feeding your dog. Because I can tell you back in Little House on the Prairie days, that dog ate what that dog found in the wild, that there was no dog food back then, you know, and they dogs did just fine, did just fine before there was ever commercial dog food. Exactly. And yeah, I, but there's so many things going on right now that my mind is like, and you know, I just, I just can't. You know something else. I, I have a, 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 an ongoing like dialogue in my own head. I am convinced that a, a diabetic raw dog food almost doesn't exist. There can't be too many raw fed dogs that develop things like diabetes and dementia. There just can't be. I'm sure it happens periodically, but I think it's the, I think it's the exception rather than. Right. I was going to say is exception, yeah. not the rule. Yeah. I, I would agree with you because I mean, how? <laughs> I know because they're not eating kibble out in the wild. No. <laughs> and kibble to me is just burnt balls of carb. Makes sense. And, Makes sense oh, to and me. something else from the movie I thought of. 
I thought it was just, it's just, it, it's disgusting that they spray paint it. They spray paint it. Yes. To look like carrots and peas and meat. Yes. Spray paint your dog's food. So you're feeding your dog spray paint. Yeah. I also heard, and this is something I forgot to talk to you about actually, is that, you know, with, with processed foods, the, they're chemically designed to addict us. We know this. Yeah, sure. The chemists will, yeah. will tell you this is what they do. That is their job. And it's a combination of salt, fat, and sugar. Yeah. Do you know that they do the same thing for dogs and they spray it on the dog food and it addicts the dogs. And that's why sometimes people have an issue switching from that crap to what they're actually meant to eat, which they would normally love. Exactly. So unless you have a lab, you know, you, you possibly could have issues ha transferring them to, you know. Raw. Plus they, their stomach acid is not what it would be if they were eating raw meat. That's right. That's right. There is a transition period when you go from kibble to feeding there your is. raw and you got to do it. You got to do it pretty slowly, but mm -hmm. it's just, it's just disgusting to me that they, they addict them like that. And that's why so many kibble fed dogs also inhale their food. They just, Oh yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. If you, if you look at it and you know, the parallels between humans and pets, like you said, between yeah. their, the biology, the nutritional needs, what we're seeing in humans and pets now yeah. with the rise in chronic disease and obesity yeah. and, you know, all of that. And, and it is very parallel mm -hmm. and yeah, people will deny that they will just, you know, refuse to believe that, oh, they're a dog. They're just a dog. They're a dog. They're supposed to eat this stuff because that's what's in the pet store. And they say on the package, healthy. <laughs> My feeling is if you have any self-respect at all, you're always going to be your own best advocate. But if you have these dogs that they, you make every one of their choices. They don't have a choice as to what you feed them. It is your responsibility as a dog owner to find out what they should what what a species appropriate diet is and i just feel like that vets most vets not my vet most vets are never going to offer anything other than kibble and say this is what you should be feeding your dog they're just because it's easy possible. you don't have to think about it you don't have to work with them you can just say uh, uh, uh there you go or even to get a a um you know this pet store where i go they do sell higher ends of quality kibble you know some people can't afford mm -hmm. you know there are some reasons why not everybody can do it but sure so tell somebody who wants to transition their dog to a raw diet and there's you know they're seeing some issues and they realize that kibble is not the best mm -hmm. what advice would you give them for starting a raw diet there's um there's a there's a there's a raw pet food calculator. It's called, you know, it keto pet. Mm -hmm. So that will give you recipes in there. If you want to make it yourself, uh, sometimes people are intimidated about making it all themselves initially. And so a transition compromise might be to suggest a frozen or freeze dried raw initially. And then when they feel confident with that, they can move on to making it on their own if they want to, or if their lifestyle supports making it on their own. Um, like I said, I, I feed frozen most of the time because that fits with my lifestyle. Um, and I'm sure I could do better. I'm sure I could, I'm sure your dogs are eating like completely ideal diets that I just making it myself is just not what I'm doing. But I would suggest to anybody that wanted to try this to start off with a frozen raw and when you see the health benefits that your dogs are 100% going to get with feeding a raw food diet, then that may, you know, you may want to go make your own from there and see what kind of benefits they'll get even beyond that. Absolutely. And the, also you, what you have to understand too, is sometimes you have to tweak just like I was talking about <laughs> with the, the, the bone meal, the bones, because of my dog not being able to chew bones correctly. You know, she went from <laughs> really gush awful runny poop to 
a very powdery poop. Right. And so those were two extremes. So yeah. I've been kind of tweaking to get more back over here without the, and, you know, so it takes some tweaking and there's nothing wrong with that because as a human, you you have to do that with your diet too. Not right. everybody is going to have the exact diet, plug it into a calculator. This is the way it is. That's a starting point. And then you tweak depending on what it is your dog needs or what you need as, as a human, you know, you, 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 and as you're, you go through life and things change as you get older, you know, you go through different things, maybe something develops and you, you have to adjust your diet to help work with whatever that issue is. I enjoy playing with my own diet all the time. I like seeing how hacking my own body with my diet affects me. And yes. I'm a dad junkie, so I like to look at all of that stuff. And I, yeah, me too. Ta-da! <laughs> okay, we're dorks. <laughs> and it's not because it's not because I'm diabetic, although I used to be. Me either. I used to be borderline diabetic. I'm me not too. Sure. It's just that I want to make sure 100% that my ketones and my glucose are where they need to be for, for me. And also I do it, I do it for health reasons. You know, I, I mean, that's the, the main reason everybody does it right. But I also like to see how things like an argument with my husband makes my glucose go up or I slept like crap and my glucose has been running high all day. And, but I also like to see how, um, you, you know, I told you before, I've been keto over six years now. I periodically cycle through carnivore, but this time I'm giving it, I'm going to not put an endpoint on it because you and I talked the other day and you've inspired me again. So now I'm looking to see how, how exactly how carnivore is affecting me and what kind of changes I'm going to see with that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I like biohacking these things. And so you got to do the same thing with your dog. If something's not working, you tweak it, you figure out Absolutely. what it is to tweak it. But you have to care enough to want to do the research and be their advocate too. Absolutely. And I, and I think honestly, most people that are dog owners, they love their dogs to pieces, just like you and I do, right? So I am hoping that when this podcast gets out and people see it, um, my followers and your followers will, will maybe take a second look at just what they're mm-hmm. feeding their dog and maybe consider that there might be something better out there. Even if it plants a seed, I will be very happy. Oh gosh, me too. And that's the same with, with low carb keto carnivore. I'm not trying to force the way I eat on anybody, but if somebody has tried everything like I did for 40 freaking years Mm -hmm. and you know, to no avail, what's the harm in trying one more thing? Right. Maybe it's that thing. Maybe it's not for you. Okay. That's fine. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not for, you know, every single person in the whole world it's for, but why not give it a go? Why not try it? If you've tried everything else, what are you going to lose? Except for possibly some health issues, maybe some weight, maybe some, uh, you know, get some mental health back. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing what nutrition does for your body. And I have never been, have my eyes open so much to just how incredibly important nutrition is, not only for humans, but for animals too. Yes. Species appropriate diet. Yes. Magic words. Absolutely. Well, Joni, it was wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I appreciate that. Absolutely. And you have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.